Welcome to Dot Social, the first podcast to explore the world of decentralized social media. Each episode, host Mike McHugh talks to a leader in this movement, someone who sees the Fediverse's tremendous potential and understands that this could be the internet's next wave. One steward everyone should know is Tim Chambers. Tim is the co-founder of Dewey Digital out of the Dewey Square Group, a public affairs firm in DC. Tim also produces the quarterly Twitter migration report, which is essential reading if you're following the social web. He's also the server admin of IndieWeb.Social on Mastodon. Today, Mike's talking to Tim about everything from the exodus from X to navigating disinformation to why moderation is better in a decentralized model. We hope you enjoy this conversation. Tim Chambers, welcome to Dot Social. Hello, sir. Good to be here. Very excited to be here. It's really, I, I've really been looking forward to talking to you um, about everything that has been happening. Uh, you know, I, of course, you're well known for the Twitter migration report, among other things, you know, running Indie Social. And, um, but the, the Twitter migration report, you know, which you came out with, uh, what was it, about a month ago? Well, actually, it's been quarterly reports all the way back to the very beginning. So the very first report was actually four weeks after Elon walked in with the sink and after the purchase happened in October. So wow. this has been a year long set of reports. I'm, I'm excited because I think that, uh, you know, the Fediverse really is something that needs to be evangelized. And a lot of people don't know what it is or if they do, um, there's just a lot of different things to think about how the world will operate, the world of social media will, will operate going forward. And that's one of the big reasons why I thought, you know, it'd be fun to talk to you. When did you first start your love uh, with the Federal? <laughs> no, that's a great question. Actually, it was very early on. I think it was about 2019 or 18 that I first started joining the Federalist and started to learn what that was about and starting to kind of understand some of the tech behind it. And it was about five years ago that we started Indie Web Social, which was sort of the next stage of learning, right? This was us building that out so that really my team and myself could understand it the best way possible, which is to start trying to build it. Tell us a little bit about what your team does, what your focus on uh, is uh, that got you going with the Fediverse. Okay, well, that's great. Um, for my day job, I work at a public affairs firm in D.C. called Dewey Square Group. My group focuses in on a few types of clients. Um, we do old school web development, as you could imagine, all the things that go along with that, web dev, uh, social media advertising, online um, social media management, online ads, everything. Uh, and then a second whole section of what I do is targeting and tracking disinformation that would be coming at the kind of clients Dewey has and giving them the earliest possible warning of what disinformation is coming at them and the earliest possible sense of what countermeasures they can do. And the Fediverse and everything involved in it, as you can imagine, really applies to both sides of that. And that's also where the Twitter migration report came. Because once the purchase happened, the whole landscape really changed. And myself and my clients all deeply needed to understand which end was up after that. I speak to you today bringing the sense of a developer and a researcher and someone who deeply understands the harms that the mainstream platforms have had in terms of disinformation. A lot of those were systemic to the platforms. And then a love for the Fediverse because I see a chance to rebuild a better social home, a better social place. And a lot of the harms that had been happening on the mainstream networks, it is possible that these emerging networks, as they become mainstream, can do better, can yeah. create a better structural incentives and can be a safer, better place to do social. Yeah. Uh, and that is a noble cause. Um, <laughs> of course, we have to understand what the problems are in order to prevent them from happening. Right. I, one of the things that's been a little, um, challenging, I think, is that a lot of the Fediverse development has been cloning the existing applications and user experiences, right? There's right. there's a desire for people who are coming over from Twitter to have it work like the way they expected Twitter to work. 
Right. Um, so there's a mix of challenges uh, on that front. When you think about the most important things that we should be keeping in mind as we build out this new world, what, what are some of those for you? First off, I, I think you're exactly right in the sense that the early efforts in the Fediverse have largely been, can we create sort of a clone of what came before? I think that's kind of been the norm in technology. The first films were basically filmed stage plays. So there's commonly the idea that you you start off mimicking the medium that occurred previously. Um, I think there is huge amount of room for innovating in the user experience of microblogging. I think that microblogging is well, well beyond Twitter or now X. Um, and even X is trying to become an everything app. So it's trying to move beyond just pure microblogging itself. And I think when you look at emerging experiments in the Fediverse, even in microblogging, you could see that evolution starting already. I'm a big fan of something called FanP. If you go to fanp.social, which is a, a particularly gifted designer, just creating a new UX for Mastodon and the Fediverse for microblogging in that space. And to me, that's one of my favorite uh, of any of the user interfaces across any of the platforms, even the major mainstream threads, Twitter, et cetera. Um, and then I also think from the trust and safety perspective, there's a great deal of work in understanding and building out what a distributed trust and safety network is when you have a Fediverse of 20,000 servers as we do today, yeah. or as that grows to be hundreds of thousands of servers, mm -hmm. and how that itself could be better than the silos have in their sort of centralized social media solutions. You know, uh, you're touching on two super important areas, right? The user experience and the backend moderation. Starting with the backend moderation for a second to dive in, the, in on that a bit. When sure. you look at the way the Fediverse operates, you have all these instances run by all yes. sorts of different people, companies, you know, et cetera. Um, do you believe that this is inherently a better model for managing misinformation um, than a sort of pure centralized model? Or, you know, are there inherent strengths and or weaknesses to this approach? Sure. I mean, disinformation is a gigantic challenge to every platform of every type, centralized or decentralized. I am persuaded by some early research that shows the benefits of decentralization, or at least the potential benefits of decentralization mm -hmm. in this space. They specifically looked at the idea of how many moderators occur compared to the users. And the idea that on the Fediverse with 20,000, 30,000 servers today, depending on how you count it, um, you have at least that many moderators. Most servers have more than one. Um, and then comparing that to the centralized silos where places like, you know, any of the meta platforms or Google, et cetera, the, the numbers that they have, the numbers that TikTok, uh -huh. even when they have thousands of people on their trust and safety teams, and by the way, they've recently been cutting those dramatically. Um, even so, the Fediverse has the opportunity to have a much better ratio between moderator to user. And actually, actually, I can give you an example from just my own experience. Mm -hmm. um, so IndieWeb Social has 11,000 registered users, which kind of surprises me. I was doing that as a pure labor of love in an experiment. It's kind of cool that it's grown to that yeah. point. Um, about 1,500 of those are monthly active users. Different number shows up every month, but about that. Mm -hmm. And we have three moderators. So if you look at that, our moderation for active users is somewhere around 500, like one moderator for every 500 people. The Digital Services Act um, has required the major platforms, the very large platforms that are operating in Europe, to be able to say, well, how many are your active users? And then how many are your moderators? Mm -hmm. And I believe the number from Twitter was only 2,200 moderators serving all of Europe. Wow. And the number of moderators from TikTok serving all of Europe, my memory is that it was about 6,100. Wow. So there is this sense where you could have a much higher, at least a potentially far better trust and safety army 
in a defederated model than you could in a centralized model. That is a really, really interesting observation The you know, also presumably more localized as well, right? Yes. I think um, you're exactly right on that. Because a lot of times you don't know, I mean, centralized moderation teams, they don't know whether something is disinformation or not. Yeah. Imagine you're on the team that is, you know, in charge of, you know, pick a country, France, like you yeah. are the entire country that you right. are, you and your team are moderating against. Right. On the Fediverse, in many cases, it's medium to small servers that have very specific communities. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, you know, themed communities. Mm -hmm. So not only would you have moderators that know the local scenario and the local languages in depth, you'd have moderators that know the topic areas that many of the people are doing. And in theory, they would be able to sniff out inauthentic content much mm -hmm. earlier. And one other factor, uh, again, using my example, all of our users know our moderators. Um, and there's direct relationships between wow. them. There's no sense where that exists other than submitting a form you know, to Facebook or submitting right. a form to YouTube. There's no relationship between the moderators and the users that can be on the Fediverse. Wow. Now, so, like, I think all of those would be in the plus column. Uh, there is a negative on the Fediverse, a challenge, in that because they are labor of love, I mean, you could make the argument, well, aren't many of these moderators just amateurs? And in many cases, they are people, kind of like myself or others, that created something because they just wanted to build a community. And they are not, in some cases, actually not mine, but in some cases, they are not trained in trust and safety things. Uh -huh. In that regard, there is an effort that I'm helping advise that I think is really important. I wanted to put into your field of view called IFTAS, I-F-T-A-S. And that is an effort at a sort of a one organization that can help any admin on the Fediverse that is looking to up their game and to get support as a moderator. So that could include best practices, how to do what you need to do as a moderator, general like recommendations or thoughts on how to do block lists, all of the sort of nuts and bolts of being a moderator, but also to share best skills. And that if disinformation attacks were to happen, that there could be alerts where different moderators yeah. can speak with one another. Right. Because collaboration yes. Yes. for moderators is incredibly important. Um, That's right. I mean, there is there is a certain amount of collaboration that happens now with CSAM. And actually, I would say there was a story I could tell you that we have the muscle memory inside the Fediverse at doing at scale moderation. Um, a number of years ago, Gab.com mm -hmm. uh, forked the Mastodon source code. And intentionally said, like, we are planning to federate deeply into this new emerging network. Wow. Yes. And for those listeners of yours that don't know Gab, they are a free speech extremist organization. That is their self-described who they are. And there is a high degree of Nazi and other hate content that is perfectly fine from their perspective to be hosted off of Gab. And so they're entering the Fediverse immediately would be violating the terms of use and the uh, and any of the servers that had signed on to the Mastodon server covenant, right? which is a best practices covenant that many, many admins sign on in terms of how to and what to moderate. Um, instantly, the, the Fediverse was able to kind of talk with one another, share notes with one another. I was able to help that. If you ever do a search on a hashtag isolate gab um uh, myself and a number of others led the charge on how to alert and educate everyone on just what was happening and so that anyone on the fediverse for whom gab would gab content would instantly violate their terms of use were able to know that know what to do and collectively all of those servers blocked them Wow. Our our overall effort was it's a free Fediverse. They have the right to speak, but it is also the Fediverse has built into it respect for freedom of association as well. That point of uh, respect for freedom of association is such a great point um, because, you know, sometimes you think in terms of social media or community as being one thing, one homogenous thing, and it isn't. 
it is inherently decentralized, right? And who you associate with, who you want to spend time with, that should be within your control. And that's one of the beautiful things about, I think, how the Fediverse has evolved is to is to give people that control. I completely agree. It um, was a beautiful part of what the original creators of the Fediverse did. And if you think about it, it also built on the ethos of sort of the web in general. It's very much a part of that whole sense of what the web should be. Um, I would also note, by the way, that a year after the Isolate Gab movement happened, uh, the Gab.com people basically decided this was not working. They gave up and ended up like turning off Federation. So it it, it fully it was sort of the first stress test, I believe, yeah. of the Fediverse dealing with content at that scale. And it is something that I think, especially those of us who were there, like carry with it as lessons for the future. One of the things that I've been struck by is when I go to you know, Mastodon or Flipboard.social, our, our, our sort of standard Flipboard instance, and I just look at um, the Fediverse, I don't see all this toxic content and misinformation. And when I go to Twitter, it's a very stressful experience because you're just inundated with misinformation. And you, when you think about like, well, what's doing, where, where, where am I seeing that? Right. It's, it's trending, the trending column. Mm -hmm. It's the for you feed posts being, you know, um, put into the for you feed. It's people that I followed mostly just to try to keep track of, but have kind of gone haywire. I remember when the banking crisis was happening and Silicon Valley Bank was going out of business. I was on a flight to South by Southwest and I made the mistake of just logging onto Twitter and checking it out. And it was just <laughs> the most stressful <laughs> moment I've ever had on Twitter. Everyone was shouting at everyone else. Um, and it was, it was just creating more of that chaos and fear that had led to some of the very problems that were that Silicon Valley Bank was uh, was dealing with, right? When people get you know right. fired up and they say this bank's going out of business, and then they all run to to take their money out. You know that's where misinformation, disinformation has this incredible. That's one example of the really problematic effects. Had I not even looked at Twitter, I would have had a perfectly fine plane ride, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> would yes. not have been anywhere near stressed out or worrying about the banking system. And, you know, so I, 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 you know, that was the day I took Twitter off my home screen and put it deep into my, into my uh, home uh, on iPhone. And now I only look at it purely as a research thing, just to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, it's amazing uh, the difference between my Mastodon experience and, and that Twitter experience. Yeah, I think I think what you pointed out there is the structural nature of this when I mentioned earlier a lot of the harms, the disinformation that is spreading, and then just the general, as you were kind of describing, negative or toxic content isn't purely accidental. Um, a lot of it is in the design of the major platforms. Yeah. As you see them focus so much on being purely ad-driven to the point of every algorithm is there to keep you as plugged in and angry or at least engaged whatever as mm -hmm. much as possible to keep you on as long as possible mm -hmm. and then to sort of micro target you to be able to sell the most targeted ads possible to you like that combination equals the kind of experience you just had yeah. and it equals that i think in varying degrees to all of the platforms but now especially lately Inside of X, uh, there is a phrase that Ezra Klein used that we thought was brilliant and stole immediately. Uh, but it was called Exodus Shock. And he said that every so often, very regularly, there's something that happens inside of X that causes this Exodus Shock. Mm -hmm. Something, and, and the wave of individuals mm -hmm. start to leave or start the process of migration mm -hmm. at various levels. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really what our Twitter migration report was all about. How to mm -hmm. how to best quantify and track with zero opinion, like just purely the facts of what's happening inside of X, that particular three month window, and then as meticulous as we can with data, what is happening in terms of people starting to or fully migrating to other places. Mm -hmm. When uh, the people that have joined Indie 
dot social. Is that yes? Um, are there any um, folks that joined that from the Twitter migration, or were they all you know? Did they join earlier? What's kind of interesting is we can say def- pretty definitively we are one percent of the Fediverse. <laughs> nice. When you track the amount of people that we are and the amount of activity that we have, that's about mm-hmm. where we are. But mm-hmm. that's a big enough sample to be able to watch the whole. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, when we when the waves happen that we marked in the Twitter or X migration uh-huh. reports. We saw those exact same waves in indie web social, uh, just to a micro degree, but it was still adding hundreds of users a day during the sort of big waves and adding dozens of users a day during the medium ones. And how did the moderation, uh, change if at all, you know? Sure. Sure. So it was there was community management beyond just migration. There was a lot of community management of just welcome to this thing called the Fediverse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like here is how it is. Here's how it's different. Here's how it's similar. Um, And then in terms of moderation, um, we had purposefully overbuilt and are doing so again in preparation whenever we think threads will federate, Mm -hmm. that we will be overbuilt for moderators for whatever spike may come. Mm-hmm. I will say this, it surprised us at exactly when and how big that spike was. And we probably grew by a thousand or two users um, very, very quickly, right after like the October, November timeframe around the purchase. Mm-hmm. And then in waves since. It was just something you could scale. Like, so it, was, it wasn't anything that another moderator or two could not help with. And that kind of speaks to our earlier part of the discussion about distributed moderation has its strengths. Right. Are these full-time moderators? Uh, no. Well, full-time if needed, but so far we've not needed more than part-time. Mm-hmm. And they it's a, it's, did I hear you right that they're doing more than just moderating? They're welcoming people. Yes. They're kind of connecting people. Community management is how mm-hmm. we think of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you must know Mike Fraser, who runs the Canadian Social Instance. One of the things that's really sure. interesting uh, that Mike does is he told me he follows every single person that joins the instance That's and, awesome. and, and tries to maintain that relationship with every single person to build that sense of community. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, it is amazing to see the different communities form. Uh, and it is amazing to see how each one has their own personalities. There's about 10 different servers that if I wasn't running this, I'd be on theirs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's great that, that it is not as uh, it is not siloed. Yeah. Yes, we have our own communities. Yes, we have our own sort of personalities to each one, but we can connect up and become part of the whole, which is, you know, that was the whole point. And when, when the, one of your moderators, let's say, decides to, um, um, terminate a user's account, let's say, uh, yeah. or block a user somehow, does that signal then carry over to other instance owners in any way? Um, you know, in other words, is there any sort of mechanism for somebody just like, well, I just, now I'm going to go create my toxic account on some other instance. Um, has there been any thought given to how to, how to take one clear signal that this, this user should be blocked and prevent it from happening in other instances? Right. I understand totally. And that is a risk inside the Fed Fediverse that, um, and I have seen examples where one bad actor was not only blocked by a large number of other servers, but removed from the main server that he was hosted on and then quickly set up another and another and another. And then, you know, functionally on the Fediverse, he could have set up his own server and then Mm -hmm. run it on his own so that he would, um, there is no, I am not aware of any tech currently that in any sort of automated way would defend against that. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's where the concept of the community of admins comes in. And how this is something you could alert across sets of admins uh-huh. through IFTAS or through online just communications in general across yeah. everybody. I assume you've had your fair share of people have tried to join as a spammer um, yes. and just, you know, how, how have you been handling that? What's that been like for you? Uh, 
Without question, there have been several waves of spam accounts created across a lot of different servers. Um, on mine, uh, for a long period of time, we didn't we had, we were purely open, so we would allow anyone to immediately sign up and have an account. Um, very quickly on, we kind of picked up, at least for us, the best practice at being open. Anyone can try to join, but we have a very simple single question that we ask them, which is, why do you wish to be here? And it is kind of amazing the number of pure bots or automated spammer accounts that answer that question with a sales pitch for their product. <laughs> so so that that simple act alone of putting up a human question, uh, let us get rid of 99% of that issue. By the way, one other larger thought, I mean, not as simple as what I just described, more of a longer term scenario. And one of the ways where I think it's fascinating to see things like the indie web and web and blogging movement joining the Fediverse. Um, I do think now that WordPress has mm -hmm. fully joined the Fediverse with their activity pub work, pub work uh, that uh, some of the work that they'd already done in spam comments might apply. Mm. Um, I, I haven't seen them even starting to think about this, but in my conversations with a number of different technologists, it seemed like their Akismet project, which was built forever ago to deal with spam in blog comments, there may be pieces of that that could help automate spam management inside the Fediverse. I am a big believer in using a lot of automated tools like that to identify um, potential problems. And then what you're really doing, I don't, I, I think it's really challenging if that's what you just rely on. Um, right. But but I think if you have people in control of these systems who are moderators and they understand, you know, what, what it means to moderate, what you're really doing is you're creating bionic moderators, right? Um, right. And enabling them to moderate at greater scale um, and, and, and preventing, um, and being able to capture problems sooner. Um, uh, so, uh, before they propagate through the network and, and harm is done. I do think by the way, that assuming that threads does federate in that, that will be a thing that the federation, the, sorry, the Fediverse needs to manage on our side that I could imagine that there would be spammers that would create content now that they would have a much larger target of the Threads universe to go after Threads. So I think that's a thing that we on our side of that fence will need to be ever vigilant on, and it's something we need to do anyway. Do you believe it's a good thing net-net that Threads is going to federate? Um, is there a right way of doing it, a wrong way of doing it? What are you looking for there? Sure. Well, inside the... Fediverse in general, there's a lot of opinions. And a number of people, especially in the early waves of the Fediverse, came to the Fediverse to get away from corporate social media in general. Mm -hmm. So there probably will be a set of people who immediately are like, I don't want to federate with the threads and I'm, I'm not going to at a server level or as an individual level. And I think in general, that's fine for them. That's sort of freedom of association, which mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier. There is another camp inside the Fediverse that is saying, I don't think that threads will ever federate. Their their conversation about this is just language. Until they do, they haven't, and it's not real. And that would say, I doubt that it ever will be real. And there is, I guess, precedent for that in big tech companies. Apple originally said that they would have the iMessage protocol on Android, and they kept never doing it. So that could, they may be right. I am in the camp now where I believe they will. Um, they are all of them saying the right thing all the way up to Zuckerberg. Uh, and every chance they get to say the right thing at every level, all the way to the tech teams, they are. I've actually had some conversations with some of the tech leaders where I was suggesting they could do some early breadcrumbs to show early nods towards the Fediverse. And they, one example was I said you could adopt real equals me, uh, a function inside the Fediverse that allows you to validate your account. And that would be a simple way to begin to do open social web validation of accounts, something you'll need anyway. And to their credit, very quickly, they got that live. So now you as a Mastodon user can, can cross-validate your account with your Threads account. 
in ways that are not proprietary. So those things all are sort of trust building. I still would say until they do it, it's talk. But it feels to me like we might be in a only Nixon could go to China moment <laughs> where a very centralized player, maybe the most centralized player, uh, is about to open up to a decentralized social media. And uh, I'm willing to see what that is. And I'm hopeful that it that it goes well. It does seem as though they really are serious about federating um, and earnest about it. And I think that's a great thing. Uh, and, you know, you're, you're the, it's almost like the warmups that we've had so far in terms of how to deal with moderation and, you know, dealing with, you know, the gabs of the world and so on, um, you know, has helped a lot to prepare for this, uh, uh, this moment. And there will be other services that are large and have large numbers of users that will federate. And some of those users are going to be fantastic to have in the Fediverse. And some of those users are going to be a problem. And, um, and so there's going to be, you know, it just pressurizes all the systems and processes that we've, that have been put in place so far. But I do, I do think that like, you know, um, the, the, your experience that you've had, you know, talking with how you do moderation on your, your service and on your instance, uh, and the other things that we've seen so far with a lot of people joining, um, you know, the, the level of toxicity that I've seen in the Fediverse is relatively low. Um, and uh, it's really it's really quite remarkable just how the, the it seems as though the decentralization model is finding a way to, to moderate. <laughs> I, you know, you're there's there are legitimate specific focused efforts to make that actually happen. There's a great quote from Matt Mullenweg where he says, people don't want to drill, they want a hole in the wall. <laughs> and I think it's in this analogy, uh, people want a better social home. And decentralization is the way or one of the best ways to date at, at how to do that if you build the structures and the incentives right, and yeah. then keep building them right. Yeah. Um, I also do like what the Mastodon team is working on now in terms of like evolving reply control. And I think that there's just tons of room for innovation. And I've probably seen more innovation in the last two years inside the Fediverse than in many sort of commercial silos in the last 10. Yeah. Well, you, I think you're getting at another really key point, which is that concept of decentralizing the innovation. Right. Yes. Um, I've I've been, you know I've worked at startups. I've started companies, and I've worked at big companies. Right. And and I it, it always is like this sort of. I was at IBM, and then right. I worked started my own company, and then I was working at Netscape, which was acquired by AOL, and then I started another company and worked for Microsoft. And one of the things I've noticed in that you know contrasting the big versus small company thing is, um, big companies have budgets. And they can only allocate, even though Microsoft is huge, you can only allocate a certain number of headcount to a certain thing, and it has to have a clear ROI. And there is a massive amount of competition for that headcount inside of a company like Microsoft or yes. Facebook. Um, and so what happens is the innovation ends up being really tied to just like however much the company believes in funding that thing, right? Which is actually many times actually less than what a startup would allocate, right? So the the <laughs> right. size of my Flipboard team, you know, is probably bigger than, you know, uh, a, a, another team that was trying to do something similar at a big giant company um, because we're we're 100 percent focused on this. And what's what I think is really interesting about the Fediverse is it allows a lot more innovation to happen from a lot more people and um and they can run their own instances. You don't have to build your own social graph. You don't have to build a whole new um, Facebook or sort of, you know, a mini version of Facebook just to get right. your social, ex, you know, concepts working, right? You, there's so much that's already been built. You've got open source. Um, so, yeah, I do think you're right that the, the, the pace of innovation as it relates to social media and the social web, I think is going to continue to accelerate and be way better than if it was just we stayed in a centralized world. Without question. Um, and then how to communicate that across each other, how to 
tap into open source efforts so that everybody can benefit from everybody. Um, I am noticing the Mammoth app, which actually I helped with on some of the innovations yeah. they were doing on um, Smartless, um, o- opening up their source code, which I think is awesome. Yeah. And as they launched their version two, seeing all the other applications in the Fediverse space applaud yeah. uh, was kind of amazing. Yeah. And you are not stuck with one UI. You are not stuck with one technology. You are not stuck with one server. The Firefish server interoperating with the Mastodon servers, interoperating with MISKEY, interoperating with everything. There is a, an incredible sort of uh, soup on which to draw from. Mm-hmm. And there also was a particularly boring state of affairs in the mainstream or siloed commercial space for so long that I think there's a lot of pent up creativity. Yes. Um, all the other platforms are basically becoming TikTok in yeah. some forms. Yep. And there's just not much else to solve there if that's their goal. Right. So then it's interesting what else can be built? Yeah. What else can come out of this? Yeah. And and literally who knows. It'll be it'll be a fascinating next this year. Mhm. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think we are potentially starting to exit the world of just cloning centralized systems and moving into the world of really, truly innovating on now the very fact that we have an open social graph, that everything mm-hmm. is decentralized. Your point about everything's just becoming TikTok in the in the walled yes. garden world. I, I, I so agree. And, you know, um, Everyone's a generalist in that world, right? Everyone has mm-hmm. video filters. Everyone has, you know, direct messaging. Everyone has their version of, of you know, a for you feed, et cetera. And, and they're just all just variants of the same thing. Um, whereas with the decentralized model, you really can have people specialize in a particular thing and do an amazing job at it. Like you could have, I could see somebody build unbelievably cool video filters and that's all they do every day and it just works (laughs) inside of the fediverse right and they don't have to build all the other things that you need to have in order to even just have a service up and running one other piece by the way that i'm very hopeful for this year is the build out of a robust activity pub test suite um i've been helping sort of cheerlead for that and to pull resources together for that and working with a team on that and it seems to me an incredibly, it might seem like techy, boring thing, but also equally super important, um, both for the development you just mentioned, to be able to, to sort of drive that so that not everyone has to build their own version of some sort of test environment, but also as more and more platforms enter into the space, as WordPress has, and as we think Threads may, um, and then others will, there needs to be, and, and currently isn't, a very robust test suite so that people can say what interoperability means. Hmm. Um, so happy, you know, that, uh, to see wheels starting to move on building that test suite out and, and on my blog and on my social, we'll be like reporting in on that as it goes. It's just another, you know, another example of how decentralized innovation is really probably ultimately going to cause much bigger ideas to come from the Fediverse in the in the coming, you know, year or two than anything that we see from the wall gardens in terms of any major new breakthrough or innovation and how social media should work. And that's incredibly exciting tools like that, enabling that um, to happen. Another thing, of course, that I think has been A challenge in the Fediverse is for any kind of um, commercial funding or commercial development or, you know, um, uh, real, you know, uh, major investment dollars, you know, in that Mm -hmm. world. What's your take on this? Is this always going to be just a grassroots kind of thing? Is there a pathway that you see for this becoming a, a bigger, more mainstream, you know, this is the way that social media happens? I mean, I think, I think you're already seeing a ton of different business models happening. I mean, you're leading some of that. So Flipboard Social being run by you, building out obviously the, the client with more and more and more Fediverse functionality is awesome. Um, I'm watching very closely 
what other commercial efforts are doing, how Medium has launched their version of that, where it's empowered by their trust and safety team, how Mozilla is sort of quietly building out their community that will launch at some point. But yeah. the more they do, the more interesting it is as you see that, and that mm-hmm. might integrate into the browser or then den- identity systems in interesting mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. And so those are all full on commercial efforts. As you see WordPress.com enter into the space, uh, that was welcomed. And I think there is a, whereas early versions of the Fediverse might have been uh, concerned or allergic to this sort of thing, mm-hmm. I think that was about 8 million people ago. Mm-hmm. I think there's been waves of new people joining and new cultures and software development related entities started mm-hmm. to wake up to this and join. And I think there's a, a sense where done well, if you prove yourself to be a good actor in the Fediverse, you're welcomed. And may a thousand business models bloom. Yeah. Um, yes. I, I, you know, that is certainly consistent with what I've seen Tim, the the Fediverse is a very welcoming place, and uh, I think that the for for good actors, for people that are listening and engaging and trying to understand it, um, it, it's been a very positive experience. It's very clear why a lot of people, not just in the Fediverse, but just in general, are disenchanted with the wall garden, big giant company social media model. Right? We've seen the damage that misinformation does. Uh, uh, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, toxicity, the, the, the surveillance economy, the privacy mm-hmm. violations, um, the people have been, you know, abused, uh, their, their loyalty has been, you know, um, taken for granted or, 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 you know, um, used in ways mm-hmm. that are pro- very problematic. And so I think people are naturally skeptical of any kind of, you know, business, uh, uh, coming in and spending time, you know, setting up shop in the Fediverse. What are the things we can do to advance the cause of the Fediverse by following the first principles that, you know, the Fediverse is built on? Now, you know, I think some folks are very concerned about things like algorithms and algorithms inherently aren't bad. The way they've been used has been a real problem in many instances. How we think about algorithmic discovery, search, you know, things like that, I think are really important for the growth of the Fediverse. You have to do that in a way that that builds trust with the community. What is your take on uh, the the role of search and discovery and algorithmic mm-hmm. models, you know, as it relates to, you know, the Fediverse? Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting because Again, a few years ago, the concept of search was a controversial one inside the Fediverse. But again, I think culture has changed. More and more people have joined. So there is there's shifting views on that. And then when Mastodon 4.2 launched and they had arguably maybe one of the best search functionalities, like far better, for instance, than Thread Search today. Mm -hmm. Um, It was opt in search. So users, each user had to opt in to allow themselves to be searched. But the adoption, there was no counter reaction against that. Mm -hmm. That was welcomed. So I think there's no reason. And I think broadly positive effect and no dramatic or at least no notable examples of that being abused. So we always have to be on guard for that. We always have to be looking for edge cases or things that could be need fixing in search. But so far, I think that was net net very positive. In terms of algorithms, I do, I'm really psyched by the algorithms that I think are very, very Fediverse friendly in the Mammoth client and in others. Um, I actually, on the blue sky side of the open social web, I think their use of find and create and share your own algorithms is a great idea. I think that's something that the activity pub world should immediately copy. And actually, I think should uh, take it one step further. I think you should be able to create your own algorithms as a user, share them with people, but then have a sort of a settings button that any user could take that, see how the algorithm works in a relatively basic way and tweak any of those settings to their precise desires and then be able to share that version. So I I think all of those things would be would be experimented with. And I think many of them would be welcomed, especially if they are done in the spirit of users still have the power to control them. And it is not something forced upon them. And it is not something driven to just make them engage 
more. And frankly, really good algorithms might make them engage slightly less because it might help them find what they want faster and have a more calm tech experience, if you're familiar with the calm tech ideas. So I think I think those are the kind of things that could almost only happen on the Fediverse, as a lot of the other platforms would be, no, any algorithm has to keep you here, if they're a commercial one, has to keep you here as long as possible and seeing as many ads as possible. I think that is a fantastic point. I, I love the concept of uh, these custom feeds that Blue Sky has been um, working on and, and the, yep. the idea of a feed marketplace, algorithmic transparency, uh, let people use as much or as little of these algorithms as they want um, based on their own choice. I really do agree with you. That's a big deal. Well, as we start to to wrap up here, what what is your, you know, what are some of your big observations you look forward to the next year? Um, either on the Twitter migration front or moderation, uh, you know, how the Fediverse you see, you know, playing out. Right. And it is a presidential year. So you will be dealing right. with a wave of disinformation and probably crazy like we've never seen across all the different social platforms. So um, a few thoughts. Uh, one is from the X side, it seems a Vegas odds would be that the... Um, Exodus shocks continue. So we probably will continue to see waves of people looking for other places. Our reports show over the last year that has primarily benefited Threads, Mastodon, and Blue Sky, roughly in that order. So I I believe that will continue. Um, we are seeing interesting things. Like, for instance, um, there is a group Indivisible that has just joined the Federation, and they are organizing people to post on X last. They have a site called xlast.org saying that if you feel like you need to stay, then do, but post, but create content on other places first and let your X users know that you should, that they should go to these other places to find content first. Um, so watching how all of that efforts like that and many others work as users decide where they want their social home to be. Um, I think that we will see in 2024 an incredible continued evolution of the open social web. And I don't think it's an accident that the three services I just mentioned were all either in the open social web or aspire to be. I think you'll probably see bridges between Blue Sky and Activity Pub start, and I'm looking forward to that. There is one effort specifically from... Uh, Bridgely Fed that I am giving counsel and advice to and some testing on. Um, I am very excited to see that happen. And the idea that the Fediverse and the Blue Sky universe could really just be two protocols that can interoperate seamlessly. I am also uh, very excited about Wikipedia. A very quiet thing that had happened this year is that Wikipedia joined the Fediverse. Um, they did so in very fascinating but sort of unnoticed way, uh, or noticed, but just within a smaller community. Um, they created their own account. They created their own server, Wiki's World. And um, they uh, built in the same sort of real equals me identity service that I mentioned earlier that Thread supports into Wikimedia, the software that runs Wikipedia. Along with WordPress, I think the Wikimedia software adopting Fediverse standards and becoming an open social web platform is super exciting. And I really hope that uh, things develop there. I'm going to do everything I can to help marshal developers to do that. Inside of the WordPress space, uh, I am continually amazed at what Matthias has built and at Automatic. Uh -huh. I am looking forward to seeing that evolve. I think it's very crucial that the Activity Pub plugin that they built becomes what's called a canonical plugin. Um, and for those not in the WordPress space, that isn't built into the WordPress core uh -huh. tech, but it's almost, it's a very central plugin that, and I think moving that up into the food chain inside of the automatic world is a crucial goal. And I'm going to be helping cheerlead uh -huh. for that. Uh, and then just continuing to use IndieWeb Social as a test case for all of that. Um, we're going to be 
you know, integrated into all the work at IFTOS. So there will be an early test case uh -huh. for a lot of the distributed moderation stuff that they will help with and uh, tying into every other bit of innovation we can. That was an epic sweeping <laughs> view of next year and the work uh, coming up, Tim. That was awesome. It's exciting times, man. And I, you know, the work that you've been doing to evangelize the Fediverse, to learn about it, to push some of these ideas forward has just been incredibly inspiring to me and I know to a lot of other people. So it was just an absolute honor to have you on the podcast and just what a great conversation. I, I'm really excited to keep collaborating and learning from you in, in the coming months. All, all good. And uh, welcome being a fellow traveler. And thank you for you know, your inspiration and the work that you're doing. So uh, here we go. Well, thanks so much for listening. You can find Tim on Mastodon at tchambers at indieweb.social. Big thank you to our editors, Rosanna Caban and Anne Lay. To learn more about what Flipboard's doing in the Fediverse, sign up via the link in this show's notes. You can also follow Mike on Mastodon at mike at flipboard.social. See you in the Fediverse. <laughs>